Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Shane Anything Podcast. It's Andy and Doug with you today. Uh, we'll be with you every Monday going through the uh, the rest of the offseason. Should be a busy one. Um, obviously the playoffs are in, in full swing right now. We have the, the ALDS starting tonight, NLDS starting tomorrow night. The Mets not being involved in that. Well, people like Andy are still doing their jobs and digging for information because there's lots to be had, um, the new regime and all we know is Sandy Alderson will be a part of it. Uh, we know Steve Cohen, if he's approved, will be uh, the owner. And uh, the rest is kind of up in the air for now. But um, Andy wrote a column recently for SNY.TV just about who might be underneath Sandy, what those roles might look like. Um, we're used to a structure where it's uh, maybe team president, GM, assistant GM, all of these things are evolving. All of these things are changing. But Andy reported a couple names. Billy Owens, Pat Russler, who Mets fans may remember, uh, Bobby Heck. Um, Andy, just take us through who those names are and what they might be doing in the Mets organization. And if you can add any names to that list. Well, yeah. And in that story, there was an important line that said Alderson could not be reached for comment. So, you know, he's not the team president yet. And uh, all the things I'm doing are reporting using my sources through the league and kind of reporting around the fact that he's not the team president yet. So just to be clear about that, but uh, I do feel like the decent feel for uh, structurally what's going to happen. And then some of the potential names within it uh, sounds like you'd have one or two GM, whether they're called GMs or not, we'll see uh, reporting to Alderson as who would be the president of course of baseball and business, but on the baseball side. Uh, so you've got uh that basic structure and then filling in some of the names. Uh, Billy Owens is someone who's worked for the A's for a long time, been described as to me as a, a terrific evaluator, also a good administrator, kind of a little bit of both. Sometimes baseball guys divide um, GM types into like administrator versus evaluator. Like Sandy Alderson would never pretend to be a scout, probably seen more as an administrator and uh, a scout GM although they're fewer and far between now, uh, would be somebody like um, Omar Minaya, say, when he was the GM, or Jim Duquette, when he, our friend, when he was the GM, uh, evaluators before their administrator. So Owens is a little bit of both. Uh, Bobby Heck, kind of similarly, a well-regarded guy in Tampa Bay. Uh, I'm told that um, Owens really is a serious name to watch here of, of those uh of that group as someone who really could be a GM or equivalent of the Mets. And then Pat Rossler, the guy who players affectionately call six, uh, is somebody who has a strong chance to be on the coaching staff. Currently the assistant hitting coach under Kevin Long in Washington um, was successful when Alderson was here, very well liked, very well prepared assistant hitting coach in the world series year. Then the hitting coach in 2018, uh, Mickey Calloway didn't like him. Uh, he was out after one year with Callaway, uh, but um, turns out that uh, Mickey Callaway is the one who's not likable. So Pat Rossler might be coming back. Yeah, uh, Mickey Callaway's judgment, um, always an interesting thing to revisit in terms of his time as Mets manager. Um, so from what you're hearing, though, Andy, and I'm not that I'm not interested in those names, because I think that's really interesting just to know uh, the uh, potential team president that Sandy Alderson is and what he might mm -hmm. be thinking, the names he's considering. Um, but we talked about when, when his name, when you first reported it and what that might mean, what team president would mean and how that's kind of business ops, baseball ops, and a mixture yeah. of the two. Do you know what he and, and Steve Cohen might be envisioning in terms of the, you know, the, the tree or umbrella underneath them in terms of what it looks like, how many GMs, what, wh what exactly this is going to look like structurally. Well, yeah, like we were saying, probably one to two GM types. Uh, and then, you know, you've got, there'll be a good amount but, of, continuity. but that's so interesting to think like uh, two GMs, uh, GM Possibly. types. So like, I don't know what the titles will assistant, be. Assistant to the general manager. Yeah, <laughs> Dwight Schrute will be one of the names if there are multiple. Uh, look, point being that the structure I, I uh, understand that they're kind of imagining is, uh, you know, Alderson is the president of baseball ops, isn't any longer like he was before, the guy who's the GM day-to-day, -day deciding who 
uh, to DFA, calling other GMs about potential trades, like all this stuff. There's like some younger guys that will be running that day-to-day GM type work. I don't know if it will be one general manager, if it will be co-general managers, if it will be a, um, you know, there's so much, so many weird titles. It could be like the baseball oriented chief good guy. Or <laughs> you know, it's like, it could be anything like that. But the point is picture uh, Dwight and Michael kind of equivalent to put this in terms that you can understand, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Dumb it down. It's, explain it to me. Like I'm five. To keep no, no, the I'm office. explaining it to you like someone who thinks of the world in terms of. No, that was another. That was another office reference when Michael can't does not oh, understand what missed. the word what the word surplus means. So he asks oh, yeah, Oscar, yeah. like, why don't you just? Yeah, I think I'm getting it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, continue. <laughs> yes, I missed that reference. So the um, let's say Dwight and Michael are uh, equivalents. Uh, no, wasn't there one time when Jim was like a co-manager with someone? Yeah, so that's the other part. So Jim and Michael, Michael. were co-managers. Okay, okay, stop there. I've got it. Those are the those are the GMs, and Alderson is um, the David guy. Wallace. David Wallace, thank you. That's what I was trying to come up with. There we go. There we All go. Right. That's how it's gonna that, work. for the record that did not work. Um, because <laughs> oh. the company, the company was bought by Saber. That's right. And then they re- like, they were like co-managers like th- that, uh, that doesn't really work. Like two guys oh. doing the job of one. I look, don't know. Look, my, uh, Jim wasn't really suited to leadership until later. And Dwight obviously had a million issues of his own trying to lead other people. So it will be on Alderson to find, uh, better leaders than, uh, Dwight and Jim. You mean Michael and Jim, but I point My, Michael and Jim, I ruined the whole thing. Well, Michael, okay, my mistake. We all know the issues there. He was he was ultimately a better leader than than maybe given credit for because he had a certain instinct for being likable to people. Um, so maybe those are some qualities that Sandy actually wants to look for, just maybe a little smarter. This is the last office reference I'll make, but Michael was a better salesman than he was a manager. And, right. uh, you know, sometimes guys get promoted because they're good at one job and they're not good at the next. That happens but in baseball. But did he turn too. out to be kind of a decent manager in the end because he had loyalty from people grudgingly? Yes. Yes. I left. think there's a deep dive we could do about the yeah. fact that Michael was uh, occasionally just um, really as, as stupid as it can get, um, mm-hmm. but also had a really good heart and um, cared about his employees like a family. Anyway, Ultimately, they liked him. So that's that's sort of what we're, I, I think, you know, and I think we can end right here because I think we made it <laughs> clear to our listeners how the Mets are going to work. Well, I, I'm fascinated by it. And so if, if there's any Met fan at home, Andy, who wants to dream about, um, I won't, I, you know what, I, I won't even, I was going to say, I won't even say Brian Cashman's name, but in saying that, I'm saying it. Uh, Theo Epstein, does any big ego, incredibly successful team president, GM out there want to say, I want to win a World Series as the team president or not team president, but GM, assistant to the GM of the New York Mets and bring a trophy back to that organization for the first time since 1986? Will any of the big names that Mets fans are clamoring for be available? They got a big name. They were, Sandy Alderson. There was a pool of dream on these, like, big, big, big name executives. There was a weekend a couple weeks ago where um, people were writing, like it was throwing a name against the wall weekend. It was Cashman, it was uh, it was Theo, it was Branch Ricky. It was like what <laughs> iconic executive. And when that all shook out, the guy was, was Sandy Alderson. All right. And Cashman and Theo Epstein are not going to work for Sandy Alderson. They would feel rightly that they're at that level themselves. Would... David Stearns? Uh, yeah. uh, how's that really going in Milwaukee? I don't know. That's a whole other story. Here's how I would say it's oh, going. He has nothing to work with and seems yeah. to field a competitive team every year. I don't know. His name swims around with the Mets here and there because he's got a little bit of background uh, there from early in his career. But I, I don't know. I don't think it'll be a name. I, I think you've got your big name in Sandy Alderson, and then he's going to pick. Um, then I gave you some names. I've got some more names that I'm uh, currently looking into. Um, you could tell us. You could tell us. I mean, 
Well, they you know, have, even they're going to be ready you, for publication. You, that this is, you know, you got to be careful with these things. You got to vet all the tips that you get. I'm sorry. To I, say. I know, but if you but just tell us, is, like, like, I'm not going to say, uh, like, it's not going to blow your mind. It's not going to be like Greg Popovich is coming to baseball and he's going to be the GM of the men. Whoa! The big, the big get with Sandy Alderson. What if you, Bill Belichick wants to that go be- from the the Super Bowl champion coach of the Patriots to uh, the assistant to the general manager of the New York Mets? That's thinks right. he can figure out baseball next. Um, oh, right. So. Under Alderson, just to finish the point, you're going to find your normal uh, scouting uh, player development department staff with a lot of good people who are still there from his time. It was only a couple of years. It's only been two years under the new administration. So you're going to see people. Uh, the Tommy Tannis, who's been running the draft, uh, would continue to do that. Uh, Bryn Alderson, Sandy's son, who's risen through the ranks, to, uh, oversee pro scouting. Um, people like that will continue to be running the organization. And as we uh, have written and talked about and a columnist at the Daily News oddly tried to make it his own over the weekend, uh, expecting Cohen to really beef up uh, the infrastructure of the team, like the analytics department, uh, the strength and conditioning stuff, like the back end. I think we talked about this at length last week, Doug. Um, yeah. The back end of the organization that's going to get a lot of attention uh, under Alderson in, in Cohen's watch. So if you read the Daily News, uh, yesterday, you would have had that uh, information only about six days late. <laughs> um, so in terms of what this regime's uh, preference will be, Andy, and um, I'm not necessarily asking you for reporting here because I think it's too early. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. nobody that you've spoken to yet is talking about you know, free agents or where they uh, might want to target their no, it's a little early for that. I mean, I'm sure I don't have that information. I'm sure that Sandy Alderson expecting to be the um, president of baseball ops within a matter of weeks, perhaps, uh, is doing his homework on that. But uh, as I said, the top priority, I think, is going to be um, setting up the organization's infrastructure in a way to create a sustainable winner. So it doesn't okay. mean don't chase a big name free agent, but it means that uh, you know, those names are obvious. How much homework do you have to do on uh, Trevor Bauer to find out if he's good? All you have to do is turn on the TV when he's pitching. You know, you know, and, and then they'll assign a value to what they think those players are worth and, and they'll see if they end up signing. Them. But okay, so how about, how about Andy Martino? Of these mm-hmm. three names, how many of the three would you go after? Zero, one, two, or three? Um, Francisco Lindor on the trade market, mm-hmm. Trevor Bauer, free agent, JT Realmuto, free agent. Uh, I would say probably Bauer over those is at the top of that list because you could potentially go try to get a James McCann who's pretty good. Uh, I'm not the first to make that point, but White Sox catcher will also be a free agent. I don't mean to diminish Realmuto at all. I mean, he's Great player, great leader. I want to know a little more about his medicals. He's missed time over the past two years. He's a catcher going into his 30s. He's going to want a long-term deal. So I think those are some things to look at. So Bauer, to me, is just um, a guy who's just at the top of his game, perhaps headed it into a plateau of a couple of years from more. So that would be the one. And then Lindor, look, he had a weird down year. Uh, I love the player. Um, but I don't know how much at this moment I want to give up for a very short window of control for a guy who just had it down here. So with Real Muto, Andy, and I, I agree with you, I think, unfortunately, the Mets have already coveted this guy, and I know Brody and his regime considered, you know, making a trade for him that you covered extensively before and they ended up signing Wilson Ramos. So they've watched him play for another team in their division in his prime. And I know he's great, but I'm worried about the same thing that he's got some age on him and he plays a position that's really physically demanding and he's had some injuries. What if you gave him a two or three year deal with like 35 million a year, 30 million a year, Mm -hmm. like you pay him a ton of money short term and try not to tie yourself to a player who might, you know, get hurt down the line. 
I think he's probably going to be in too much demand to get away with anything creative. He's just going to be the best position player free agent on the market, unless I'm forgetting anyone obvious, but I'm pretty sure that's true. And uh, you just, there's going to be a bidding war. So you're going to have to, if you want him, you're going to have to go further than what you're comfortable with. As often happens, obviously with these big guys to, to get him, you have to give him that extra year or two, that extra money that you don't want to give. Cause that's the way to reel them in. I mean, if you think the Yankees wanted to give Garrett Cole, nine years to a pitcher who's turning 30. No way, but that's what it takes to get him. So I, I bet you Real Muto's going to end up in a, sort of a similar uh, uh, boat. Yeah, well, it's it's such an interesting part of negotiation that a lot of times, especially if the team covets the player and feels like they have to do whatever they can to get that player, that you have to just like sign up for something you really don't want to do. Uh, yeah, it's, they almost feel from a business standpoint, you're paying for years that might not be worth it to, for the, to get the guy for the short term as part of the acquisition cost. This one actually worked out better than, than this, but one, I remember when the Cubs signed John Lester, a Cubs person at that winter meetings was explaining to me, look, you figure we're ready to win now. Uh, he'll be an ace for a couple of years. You know, he's going to miss a year or two with Tommy John in the middle of it. Then I'll be a back on guy at the end. You know, we sort of figure all that in. Um, and that's just, you know, it's not ideal, but that's what you have to do to get, get the big free agents of it. You know, what's so interesting is, um, you know, we had the other night, Adam Wainwright and Clayton Kershaw on the mound for their Mm -hmm. teams and playoff games on the same night. And you realize that not every pitcher, even in today's game, you know, wears down and by 35 to 40 is, you know, a shell of their former self. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'll, those guys have gone through transformations, um, but you're right that John Lester is an interesting example of when you sign a pitcher, um, and I don't think Bauer, to, to bring this back into our conversation about the Mets this offseason, I don't think he's anywhere close to what we're talking about. He's in his prime. And mm-hmm. also, I'm not sure he wants a long-term deal, but it, it is possible to sign a guy to a eight-year contract, even a pitcher. And, you know, there may be a rough year or two in there, like Justin Verlander went through in Detroit. And then they figure it out. The great ones do. Um, let's and go by to the way. It just popped into my mind, but I covered Sandy Ollers as a GM for eight years. And he's not one to do stuff like that. And f- philosophically, that's not, that one's not really so much about which owner has money and which one doesn't. That, I, I have a hard time seeing him think of something like that. I, I could be proven wrong in his second time around. He's older. He's not going to, I'm sure, not planning on being here quite as long as the first time and all those kinds of things. But I know Sandy Alderson from years of covering him and I've never heard him say anything like, well, you give a guy too much here and on the back end, it's bad. That's not how he thinks he's trying to be efficient all the time. Yeah. But you know, what's interesting. And you know, this is just the, the, the reality of the situation. We don't know how he would or will operate with an owner who's worth 14 billion. And you know, would he be more willing to do something maybe fiscally or financially irresponsible to get, you know, to, to have more celebrations than he did when he was the GM of the Mets. He, he wants to have the celebration that stems from fiscal responsibility and sound logical decisions. He's too logical to go crazy in the free agent market more than every once in a while, because he believes that it's an inefficient way to, to build a team. I mean, sometimes look, he had the highest payroll in baseball with Oakland. 30 years ago, he, he, he does know how to spend uh, in the Cespedes contract more recently, but he believes in rationality and targeted spending. So no, I don't think he's going to be the guy in any way, shape or form. That's like, get me that big free agent, that big free agent. I'm 73. I don't care. Bring them all in. Someone else is footing the bill when I retire. That's never going to be Sandy. Okay. So even, can I make a comparison here? So you cover, Brian Cashman closely too. Mm -hmm. Now Cashman, I think from the outsider's perspective, went through a couple of years where he, it was a tremendous source of pride for him that after the Ellsbury signing, he made a lot of smart moves and, and was able to kind of maneuver around and put a really, really talented young team on the field as early as 2017. Um, Then he signs Garrett Cole. So wouldn't you say that Cashman is one of the more well-respected uh, move makers in baseball 
likes it both ways that, that he, yes, he gets more pride out of Gio or Shella performing at third base than he does uh, somebody he signs to a hundred million dollar contract, but he likes to have the ability to sign the player that he covets. Oh, absolutely. But I'm describing Sandy Alderson who, who is, uh, but you don't think Sandy would, if he believes the player is an a plus signing for his team, wouldn't Sandy want to sign that player? That's what I said. That's why I said he, he'll spend in a targeted way. He'll spend when he feels it's necessary, but he's not going to be um, that guy who's aggressive after every free agent. And he's going to be that guy that goes, my owner's got 14 billion, but if I don't think it makes sense to give a catcher seven years, I'm not going to do it. That's saying, that's the way Alderson thinks. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And you know what? It maybe it's, it's, it's probably more – there's more to the, the, the Sandy potential hire by Cohen than just like, hey, this makes me an easier sell to the rest of the owners. Maybe oh, yeah. Cohen's, like, Cohen's like, you know what, um, I want this guy to, to make these financial decisions for me because, uh, you know, I can afford every player. And well, I need somebody you, to it, – Sorry to interrupt. It tells you something that he didn't try to woo A.J. Preller from San Diego. He hired Sandy Alderson, who's known for – rational, uh, slow, methodical, at times to a fault. Uh, there were times it's like, Sandy, you could trade, um, you know, you have the stable of young pitching. You could trade one of them for a position player. And like year in, year out, he never did. And so he finally did. But he can be really slow and deliberate. That's what Steve Cohen decided he wanted, uh, clearly, because that's who he hired. Of those three guys that I mentioned, I, I just want to put an idea out there quickly. So – we had very casual conversations about Mookie Betts last off season um, and what that would be like. Could the Mets, you know, uh, trade for him and then, you know, sign him. Would he want to be a Met long-term? Would you really sacrifice a lot for potentially only one year? And then he leaves similar conversation now with Lindor who legitimately did like a joker laugh when a reporter asked him, like, do you mm -hmm. think the Indians are going to spend more to surround you with talent or whatever? And he was like, spend more like, <laughs> it was weird, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was a little weird. Isn't, isn't this now what you have the opportunity to do with Steve Cohen, which sure. is, this is a great player. And if you think he's overrated because you just watched the series against the Yankees, just go look at what he's done for like the last four years. Listen to him in interviews. Other than that answer, uh, the in-game interviews at the all-star game, like this is a prime personality in the big leagues. And, um, don't you now have the ability to make a trade and, and know that you, you can keep the player, you, you know, like, and, well, and I know he's only 26. And I, I just, one of the things that I've learned from you and Keith, especially this season is that one season does not translate to another. And Andre Jimenez has been really impressive and really good. And mm -hmm. I like the player, but I'm just not ready to say it's not worth sacrificing his future for Francisco Lindor because Lindor is a great player. So I would consider that these oh, are the kinds of things that you can sure. do. Yeah. You, I, I'm not even a Mets fan. I would drive him in as the Cleveland for that one, just on the basic principle. You know, it, it, uh, I hear you. I hear you. And maybe we'll see. Look, uh, I, I will also tell you that a lot of the people in that organization who remain uh, loyal to Alderson feel that too many prospects and too much depth have been traded and i bet you that they really will prioritize building that back up rather than getting rid of it for for a, a lindor right away but you never know what presents itself i mean you, we don't know who the gm is yet so uh certainly i know what you're saying and at least yeah the mess could be in a position if that bets trade were a year later to make the trade make that effort to sign them give them the three four hundred million like teams do and just like be like all right this is what teams do although I'll believe Sandy Alderson's giving a guy $300 million when I see it. Yeah. I, I've, I mean, he is disdainful of big contracts at times. I've seen it. When the Nationals signed Jason Worth to a seven-year deal, six-year, six, seven-year deal, Alderson sits down and we were still getting used to him. We didn't know he was going to be like a funny guy yet. Like, it was like, we sit down the street like, ah, Sandy, do you have a comment on the Nationals' Jason Worth contract? And he goes, well, I thought they were trying to lower the deficit in Washington. And it was like, oh, this guy's got jokes. And it was kind of the beginning of that. But it was, uh, he's, he was the one, I don't know if you remember this, when the Rangers signed A-Rod and the, 
and the Rockies signed Mike Hampton in the winter of 2000. Alderson was one of the ranking executives in Major League Baseball, and he was publicly ripping these contracts publicly. These owners are spending wildly. They shouldn't be doing it. So that's his base level, you know, philosophy. Okay. I, I, my, my reaction to everything that you've said so far in this podcast is mm-hmm. I, I believe Sandy Alderson to be a smart baseball man. And I think he was a great potential hire for Steve Cohen. But if there, I think there are Met fans listening right now who are listening to you to describe his hatred for these huge contracts being like, okay, we were kind of hoping that a four, an owner worth 14 billion buying the team would mean that we were now players for all the big fish. Did he really have to hire the, the team president who is known for having disdain for going after the big fish? Like, what would you say to that line of thinking? I would say to that line of thinking, it's not my job to make you feel better. It's my job to report the facts. But if it were my job to make you feel better, I would say that Steve Cohen's uh, goal appears to be building a team that's going to be contending and that you can root for year in and year out. And Sandy Alderson is a smart hire for that. All right, last thing, and we'll continue with the, the Sandy trend. In the absence of access, you have like a um, – not one one wish to be granted, but you have one question that Sandy Alderson in his answer has to be completely honest with you about on the record about. Mm-hmm. And he says, Andy, ask me whatever you want. You get one. Uh, what would you ask him? Does it have to be about the current Mets? Because <laughs> he's had a long career of like a lot of interesting things. Yes, it has to be about the <laughs> potential potential job that he's potentially accepted already. Because there was this one time when Ter- uh, Jordani Valdespin was mad about getting sent down, and they went in the shower, and he put soap all over his butt, and he stuck his butt in Terry's face in the shower with so all soaped up. And Sandy was there. I'd like to know if Sandy saw that or was aware. But I guess that wouldn't be the most important question. It's just kind of a funny thing that happened. That is a really gross visual, but yeah, you That's can continue. That's a true story. These are the things that go on in baseball clubhouses. Um, uh, are you going to throw out Luis Rojas with the bathwater, Sandy? Because you shouldn't, in my opinion. That that I guess maybe I'd go for that one. So you would insert in your question, you would insert your own opinion? Uh, yeah, I would, and I would point my finger at it. Like an inch from his face and be like, are you going to do something that would be stupid if you did it? And he'd be really intimidated and he, he would, he, oh, he would. <laughs> and uh, he, he, uh, no, I would say this. I would say, Sandy, will Luis, Ro- I, I would ask it straight. Sandy, will Luis Rojas be the manager of the Mets next year? That's what I would say. Do you have any say, idea say, what no. he thinks of Rojas? Huh? Do you have any idea what he thinks of Rojas? I just want to say, oh, do I know what he thinks of him? Uh, I don't think that they, I, I know that they didn't know each other very well in the years they were in the organization together. It wasn't really a GM's department to deal with a guy in player development, minor league manager. Uh, so there's not a real big relationship there. Um, some of the people around Sandy who he trusts will probably say that Rojas is a good developing manager, not a great manager yet by any stretch, but a guy who's smart and can collaborate. Uh, So he's got some homework to do on on Rojas still. There's not a ton of uh, history there between the two, even though they worked in the same organization for many years. Well, I could just see the the mental image in my head, Sandy Alderson, a Marine uh, who just, you know, is is, uh, in the process of beating cancer, being just physically... Uh, intimidated by Andy Martino pointing his finger at him in a in a very Jeff text intense the way. Producer that he's a Marine. It's like I know that, and I still <laughs> he would be intimidated. Obviously, I understand that he's been in the jungles of Vietnam, but he's never faced down a question from a hard, hard, tough reporter quite like me. He's had me right. before, but I mean, no one like me. I'm like Mike Wallace on steroids when I'm asking about Luis Rojas. So Sandy, back down. Let's let's uh, let's end it there. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. 
Uh, thank you for listening, everybody. Once again, for the rest of the offseason, we'll be with you every Monday. Keith will get mixed in and you'll be mixed in. I will seemingly be here every week. I don't know why they keep letting me do that. Uh, but we appreciate you listening as always. Rate and review us if you can. And we'll talk to you next week.